Well, good morning, Ritman Grace Brethren Church, and uh, thank you so much for all those that could uh, make it out this morning. It's great to see your lovely faces, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in, for everyone that is uh, uh, tuning tuning in with us online. Uh, it's great that we could all uh, be gathered in whatever way, shape, or form that is taking place. Uh, my name is Clark. I'm one of the leaders on our staff, and if I've never met you, love to meet you, get to know you uh, a little bit. Um, I'm so excited that we could uh, gather again today. Uh, I want to encourage uh, everybody, whether you're uh, in here today or whether you're online, to uh, check out filling out one of our Connect cards. Uh, we'd love to just stay updated with what's going on in your life, as well as uh, just taking any prayer requests that uh, you might have. If, if you need any prayer in your life or if you know somebody that needs prayed for, uh, let us know. Uh, for those of us that are here today, we can grab these on the way out and bring it back later. Drop it off if you want. Uh, for those online, you can actually go to our uh, website, rittmangrace.org. You can find the link to fill that out. And so again, just want to encourage everybody to take advantage of filling those out. Uh, we count an honor and a privilege to be able to pray uh, for every one of you. So I just want to encourage you with that. Something else I just wanted to uh, reiterate. Uh, you've probably been, uh, if you have been joining us for our Zoom fellowships online, uh, we're going to continue those, and so this, I guess, is specifically for those tuning in uh, through Facebook and whatnot, but uh, our Zoom fellowship, the reason we have that is to kind of create a space for those of us uh, that want to just kind of stay caught up with what's going on in each other's lives. Uh, we also think it's a great opportunity to maybe meet somebody new and have an opportunity to be able to pray for uh, anybody in any way that we can, so I just want to encourage you to uh, tune into that. Uh, if you choose to do so, on our website again, uh, RaymondGrace.org, and you could find the link that says uh, Zoom Fellowship. It'll ask you to type in a password, and that password is actually our uh, church phone number, which is 330-925-3626. So I want to encourage you to continue to take advantage of that, and uh, hope to see you there. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1 through 11, says this. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheave rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of this dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. I just want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer before we begin our morning message. Well, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for who you are, Jesus, and uh, we recognize uh, you as our sovereign King of King and Lord of Lords. And uh, Lord, we thank you for an opportunity uh, to gather together today, whether it be for those of us who are gathered in person or those of us that are gathering uh, with us uh, online. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask for uh, uh, peace and uh, unity. Uh, within um, our community, our country, our world uh, during this uh, turbulent time. Uh, Lord, we ultimately look, look to you, Jesus, as uh, our Savior and as the author, perfecter of our faith. Uh, Lord, I pray specifically uh, that we would be able to bless you during our time together. Pray that your word would uh, 
encourage us and challenge us and convict us in the way that you uh, would choose to do that. Uh, Lord, uh, help us bless you in our time together. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm just wondering how many of you, when you were growing up in your parents' home, how many of you were the favorite child? Uh, yeah, I figured as much. <clears throat> Several, way too many. So we have a spoiled group of people here today. That's cool. <clears throat> or what about when you, if you were parents, if you became a parent, if you had picked one out as their favorite one and and doted all over them. There are times when families have maybe a child with special needs that needs special attention, and that's significant. They need to do that. But you also, in that case, have to use extra efforts to be sure that the other siblings feel welcomed and loved and accepted. We're going to look at a case today. I called this favorite son or spoiled brat. And um, Pastor Clark has already read to you the passage from Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> and I'm going to mention the first three verses talk about Jacob's favoritism, how he favored this one child. Now, just a, a footnote for you. The rest of the book of Genesis, from 37 on to chapter 50, is almost predominantly about Joseph and his life, and there's a reason. He has written about more than any of the other patriarchs, at least in the book of Genesis. There's only two sections in the rest of this uh, book that don't center on Joseph, just two small sections and two different chapters. But the reason why is because Moses is writing to a group of people who are now refugees out of Egypt. Remember, the writing took place hundreds of years later when this event took place. And Moses wants the uh, children of Israel to know and to understand certain things. <clears throat> Whether it, um, <clears throat> Some of the things that he wants them to know is how they developed as a tribe where they came from, how, how this came about. To you and I, this is really interesting stuff. But to the Jewish person, this is their family heritage. This is who they are and how they got that way. Uh, it was important for those coming out of Egypt to understand how they came from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then Joseph and how they got to Egypt and, and how... Uh, they have developed for the last almost 500 years when they were leaving that area. But it also proves the providence of God. The providence of God, that's a word that maybe we don't use much. A hundred years ago uh, in our country, people used to call God, not God, they would call him providence. And they would say things like, well, may providence bless you today. Um, and they just use that word a lot. It has to do with the daily care, how God is there present every single day. It would have been really easy for Joseph to got bogged down in the years to come with the mundane life that he was experiencing. Some of his experiences were quite, um, quite unfavorable for him. And it would have been easy for him to just say, where's God? But it's very significant for him and for us to every day to understand that God is present, God is involved, and it doesn't matter what the circumstance at the moment is, God knows, he cares, and he's a part of all of that. So that was something that the rest of this writing in Genesis is going to help us with. It also shows us the amazing character of this person, his personality, his um, behavior, Joseph. Is just an amazing person and is probably way above the ideal of what we could ever hope for ourselves, but it's still great to see. And another thing it does, it helps share the types of Christ. It typifies uh, some things about Jesus. We're going to see pictures 
illustrations, um, foreshadows of who Christ the Messiah is going to be. So you, you want to look for those things as we go throughout uh, this study in the life of Joseph. There's no way to misinterpret. You can't miss it. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. Absolutely no doubt about it. Now, the scripture told us that Jacob was older when Joseph was born. I would say he was probably more like a grandfather image to Joseph uh, than a real father would be like in the sense we think of it. By the time Jacob and, and Rachel had Joseph, he would have been much more relaxed, a lot more easygoing. He probably enjoyed this experience a little bit more than he did the others. But then I'd say, isn't that always the case when you have your 11th son? We all love them the best. We know that's true. He learned from all his previous experiences, and maybe he adjusted more to marital life, which is crazy because he had four wives that we know of. So um, he was just in a better position, maybe even economically, to, um, to be a relaxed, solid father. And Joseph was the son of his most beloved Rachel. This is the woman of his life. This is his soulmate, and Joseph is the firstborn from her, born out of love and affection. <clears throat> when I was um, high school age, I was playing on a travel baseball team. I had a teammate. His name was George Warwick. So if you're watching, George, hello. I want to see you again. <clears throat> I haven't seen him since. I only played on the same team with him for one year. It was in and out of life. George was a quiet gentleman, very respectful. He was tall, dark hair, thin, left-handed first baseman. He could hit a ton. He was really, really good. But he was a very quiet guy, and I was drawn to him. I liked him. <clears throat> One day, uh, we had a rain delay in a game. It was pouring. And George and I scrambled to pick up the equipment when everybody else ran to the clubhouse. And... It got to be where it was really raining hard, and we decided, let's not even try to go that way. We just went under a concession stand. So it was just him and I standing under the uh, awning of the concession stand, and his parents, who I'd never seen before, came over. They must have been watching in a car or something, and they came over, <clears throat> and it was fascinating to me because they were obviously older. I mean, like, they were really, really old. They were probably in their 60s. Okay, I know. But back then, that was the same. That's 100 back then. <clears throat> but anyhow, I, I was so impressed. Everything that George said to his parents at the end of the statement always ended with, yes, mother, yes, father. I'd never heard anybody call a parent mother or father I thought it was the most respectful thing I had ever seen. It really, really impressed me. And I think now that, you know, here were some older parents who they didn't have any other kids. He was an only child. But just the, uh, the lifestyle that they had would have been different. And it made me think of Jacob and Joseph, you know, with older parents. And I think Joseph was that respectful to his father as well. Here's a question. What's the best way to raise a child today? It's a pretty weird world, isn't it? How do you bring up a child that's going to be successful, mature, strong, safe, all those things? You know, child psychologists will tell you that a child's attitude is generally set by age three. Sorry, it's three. I knew you get it wrong, but everybody else got it right, so... <clears throat> age three. Christian researchers will tell you that spiritually, life's decisions are made by age eight. Pretty significant. It's pretty rare for someone much older, much older, to come to know Christ as Savior. We've had that in the past. We've had people in their 70s come to know Christ, but that's extremely rare. So when I ask, what's the best way to raise a child, I think it's in a Christian home 
where the Bible is honored and read, where prayers are heard, and songs are sung. We, Some of you grew up when my kids grew up, and I think that was one of the best eras for kids to grow up because they had Salty. Salty. That was a, a musical singing hymn book. It was a guy in a hymn book. It was great. I got to know him a little bit at one time. That was fun. But the songs they sang were so amazing, just so great. Praise songs of Christ, taught so much, um, just really good stuff. And now my grandkids listen to it. And we actually just bought some recently again for them uh, on CD this time. Uh, it's just great. Kids need those experiences, hearing the word of God, hearing family members pray and enjoying songs. Heard about the uh, church service once where the pastor was at the back of the door and he was greeting all the people as they were leaving. And this one family came and little Billy was just crying uncontrollably. And um, the pastor's like, well, what's wrong with Billy? And the parents said, we don't know. Right in the middle of your sermon, he just started wailing and crying and he hasn't stopped since. Pastor leaned over and said, Billy, what's the matter? Why are you crying? And he said, you said you want us to live in a Christian home, but I don't want to move. <clears throat> that would be sad, wouldn't it? I, I'm glad I wasn't the parent at that one. Boy, would that be indicting. Can you just imagine the joy that Joseph brought to Jacob? He would be the constant reminder of the woman that Jacob really loved the one he felt closest to, his soulmate, the one that was so important to him. Joseph was absolutely special, no doubt about it at all. Verse 2 tells us that Joseph came into the home to Jacob and reported about the bad behavior of some of his brothers. Scripture tells us it was the boys of um, Bilhah and Zilpah that he came in and told that they had done something wrong. We don't know what it is. We have no idea what they have done wrong. There's no doubt that these half-brothers of Joseph were spiritually unfit to be his companions. You would not want those boys hanging out with your kids. No way. No way do we want them around them. And, and you can understand a little bit. This may explain. It does not excuse. But... Those brothers were raised in Haran, back where Laban lived, and there was all kinds of ruffians, and it was a pagan culture. There was a lot of idol worship, so there was no real positive influences. And then they had to watch as Jacob and Laban had all kinds of dealings with each other. They were all dishonest, trickery, a lot of bad stuff between them, plus... Can you just imagine having four mothers who are all extremely jealous of each other? It, it just had to be a, a horrible experience for those boys to be under. And those boys were older when Jacob had his experience at Peniel. That's when he wrestled with God. And, um, and God realigned his hip and realigned his heart. These boys were older. And that probably didn't impact them as much as it did Joseph, who was raised by the one God said, you're no longer Jacob, you're now Israel. What they did, we don't know. <clears throat> but whatever it is they did, some commentators think that it was well known and maybe even notorious in the hood. Everybody knew what they did except for mom and dad. By the way, people think, well, how can that happen? How can somebody do something wrong and mom and dad doesn't know it? Come on now. It's happened to you. It's happened to me where the kids did something wrong and we didn't know it till later on. I've heard that a number of times and it does happen. So anyhow, Joseph goes in and tells Jacob, here's another good question. Was Joseph a tattletale? Was he a tattletale or was he just doing what was right? The theological debates have gone on and on for centuries about that, and I've read some on both sides. I have my own opinion. 
it's possible that Joseph felt a sense of family duty. Maybe he was protecting the reputation of the family and didn't want that to be marred. Maybe in Joseph's mind, it was not only justifiable, but it was necessary that this be dealt with right now. Here's another question that I don't think we can answer. Did Joseph get a sense of pleasure from reporting on his brothers? Maybe, maybe, maybe that felt good to see that um, now they're going to get in trouble. Now they're going to be treated this way. So when I go back to the title of what I've called this message, Joseph, a favored son? Absolutely yes. Joseph, a spoiled brat? I think not. I don't think so. I think Joseph told his father because he had such a deep conviction about what is right and what is wrong and just felt this needed to be dealt with. I find it interesting that in Right at the end of that discussion about reporting his brothers, it, and then that it tells us that Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of them. And then it tells about the special, unique, rich coat that uh, was made for Joseph and given to him. <clears throat> the, um, the concept of the coat, there, the Hebrew construct has two different words that are compounded, put together, and they really represent in their roots three different concepts of what this could be. And I believe that Moses used those three words together because he wanted all three concepts to be together. Here's what they basically mean in their roots. Um, Number one would be that it could be a coat of many colors. And that's the way people think about it. That's the way King James translates it. What was that play or musical called Joseph in the Technicolor Coat? Um, yeah, that's, that's the way most people thought of it. A few years ago, Ann got me at a garage sale a zipped-up hooded sweatshirt that was red, blue, yellow, green, red, blue, yellow, green, big, bright. Oh, I love that sweatshirt. I would never wear it where anybody saw me except for Ann. I kept thinking we need to take a picture of that in case I ever speak on this again. Unfortunately, I went to the burn pile a long time ago, about a year ago. But it could have been many colors. Or it, this makes a lot of sense, too. It's a tunic with long sleeves. And I, I'll bet not just long sleeves, probably below the knee, maybe even down toward the ankle. Now think about it. You're in the Middle East, and you're going to wear something like that, an outer tunic that goes covers everything and goes down in 100 plus degree temperature. This was not a coat that was designed for practical purposes. It was not someone who was wearing it while he worked in the sand dunes or whatever he was doing in the gardens. Um, It was different than that. It wasn't for that purpose. Here's another concept. It was an ornamentic tunic. So that means it was highly decorative. So there were probably strips of gold in it. There were probably some sequels put on it. There was just all kinds of things that made this unique. Definitely, this was a ceremonial robe and was decorated distinctly. It was not for everyday functional use. This was just a gift that is so unique and so special. Maybe you only wear it on special occasions. That same kind of robe is mentioned elsewhere in 2 Samuel 13, verse 18, when it's talking about Tamar. Tamar was a a daughter of royalty, and it says there that this was the kind of coat that was worn by the virgin daughters of kings. So this was just a unique, special kind of gift. And Jacob gave that to his son, And I think he got a lot of pleasure out of that. This uh, gift became a very convenient way to remind Leah and her family, maybe rub it in just a little bit, that the birthright has been taken away from Reuben, the firstborn son, and the firstborn to Leah, and given to Joseph, who is, what is he, the 11th child, but he's 
the firstborn son of Rachel. The reason that the birthright was taken away from Reuben, you go back to chapter 35, verse 22. I think I put in the bulletin verse 2, but it's 22, where it tells us that Reuben slept with the handmaid Bilhah, with the uh, concubine of Jacob's, and Reuben committed sexual sin with her. Also in 1 Chronicles 5, 1 and 2, it says the same thing and says that he defiled his father's marriage bed. So he forfeited the, uh, the birthright. And so Reuben, the firstborn of Leah, had forfeited the birthright. So that birthright was taken from him, not given to any of the children of Bilhah or Zilpah, but given to Rachel's firstborn son. And he was the one who was now elevated as the number one person to inherit all the, um, the, in the estate of Jacob. That had to be a really difficult thing for the other brothers to see and to observe. Joseph's purity of life and his moral growth probably rankled his brothers big time. They probably hated this goody good shoes. Jacob's love poured out on top of that, probably made it very difficult too. They looked at Joseph and they just saw him as a constant irritation. That's all he was. Verse four tells us a little bit about the sibling rivalry that had developed and, and was growing. There was jealousy and jealousy is something that devastates human relationships, just destroys them. It creates unhappiness in unparalleled degrees. And with all those older brothers, it became a group hatred. There was a mob mentality anti-Joseph. And if you know anything about mob mentalities, which I think we do in our country, they can spur each other on. It just needs to plant a suggestion and then it can get out of control. Joseph knew that he was not in harmony with his brothers. He felt every day the rejection that was his growing up. And he had that from a toddler on up to now. It told us in verse 2 that he was 17 years old. I thought that was interesting the way Moses introduced chapter 37, by the way, when he said, this is all about Jacob. Now, Joseph. <laughs> It's like, hold it, where, where did Jacob go? It's all about him, but it that makes sense to me. It does, because Joseph was pretty cool. But as a 17-year-old, he was a little bit naive. He was young, and he lacked some experience. Jacob, by favoring him and promoting him and putting him forward all the time, was sort of setting up Joseph for failure within the family unit. The other kids, the other brothers, the older ones were all trouble. They were a lot of trouble for Jacob and, and the family. But here's Joseph, disciplined, cooperative, sensitive, loving, just an all-around good guy. Really easy for the other ones to not like him. In some ways, the problem here was more Jacob's than it was Joseph. As a parent, he didn't handle things all that great. Well, then comes a really fun events, verses 5 through 11. <clears throat> Joseph has these two dreams. And in the first dream, he, he pictures a bunch of sheaves. Now, we all know what that's like because we drive around enough Amish farms to see them all stacked up and lined up. And, and Joseph sees that and he has one that's representing him and the others apparently representing uh, his siblings. And his rises up and gets good and high. And the siblings all are bowing down to him. Can you just imagine the reaction by the brothers at this? Verbally, they responded by, you intend to reign over us. Who in the world do you think you are? What do you mean saying that you are going to be over us? That is absolutely ridiculous. You're just a teenager and we're full grown adults. 
what are you thinking? But the emotional response is that they hated him all the more. In verse 4, it had said that they hated him so much they could not even say one kind word. Never like pretty day today, isn't it? <laughs> Nothing like that. They could never even speak to him. In their culture, uh, and even at the time of Christ, sometimes when you went by somebody that was despicable, you would spit. And maybe not at them, but you would turn and spit just to prove your disgust to them. And I could see them feeling that way all the time. And now, not only did they hate him before where they couldn't say anything nice to him, now they hate him just so much more. Uh, it's just gotten a whole lot worse. So here's a question. Was the dream supernatural uh, or was it just a, a vision of grandeur that Joseph was having, puffing himself up? To hear the answer to that, you need to stay tuned. This will end about August 30th, so just hang in there. You have an advantage. You can read ahead. But don't do that. Wait till I, no, do what you like. That's fine. The brothers probably came away from that saying, that's ridiculous. He made all that up. It's not true. None of that is real. Joseph came away from it saying, I wonder if God has a plan for me. I wonder if there's something that he wants me to do that is unique, special. Maybe he's going to uh, own lots of flocks or lots of land. Maybe there's something really neat. He, he has a second dream. And in the second dream, there's 11 stars and the sun and the moon. And they're all bowing down to him. This dream included just a little bit more detail. And it becomes way more than obvious. The 11 stars are his siblings. And the sun and the moon uh, represents his parents. And in this case, because uh, Rachel had already passed away, when Jacob said, does this mean that your mother and I are going to be bowing down to you? He probably was referring to Leah. Because Leah had probably come on and taken the responsibility of the family um, and for all the children. You know, Rachel died in childbirth. You have a baby, you know, minutes and day, hours old, somebody had to care. And Leah was probably the one who did that. She took over the responsibilities for, for Rachel. Everything I find in the scripture says that Leah was a pretty good person. She was pretty okay. Apparently not as attractive as Rachel, but she seemed to have some good qualities. So there's a repetition of dreams, two dreams that take place, the same concept or theme that's going on. And some suggest that the fact that the repetition of it implies the certainty of the fulfillment. This is absolutely going to happen. But if nothing else, we know it only added fuel to the fire. So let's think about just a couple of the very valuable kind of lessons that we can learn from this particular incident and experience. All of us, all of us have factors within us that cause us to see things not always as they really are. We see things the way we see them, the way we perceive them. We don't always see them the way they are. I was going to, uh, I didn't do it, but I was going to bring a ping pong ball. And I was going to say, this is a ping pong ball. What do you know about it? And you could tell me lots of things. It's plastic. It's got air inside of it. It's used for a game. There's, it can float on water. You can tell me lots of stuff. And you and I could go do a thousand facts about a ping pong ball. And then I would have to say, but that's not everything. <laughs> we don't know who manufactured it. We don't know what state it came from. We don't know a lot of, we don't know how many times it's been bounced on a table or hit with a paddle. We don't know those things. My theory is, in life, I think I've observed that no one knows everything about anything. <laughs> I think no one knows everything about any single thing, whether it's a ping pong ball or a book on the shelf or a gourmet dinner. Nobody knows everything about any of that or any other thing. <clears throat> so you and I would answer a lot of questions with, I don't know, if we're wise. So 
Here's what I'm going to suggest under this. Um, maintain an attitude of openness and teachability. You know, the situation where there's a car accident at an intersection and there's someone on this corner and someone on that corner and they start giving the, the uh, details to the police officer and it turns out they have totally different viewpoints as to whose fault it was. I remember once um, I was chatting with my sister on the telephone and she started to recount a certain incident that happened in our youth and she was giving details and I was trying to adjust her details to make them a little bit more correct. And she strongly got upset at me and started telling me, no, it was this way. Even when I reminded her that I was there and she was not, she was still right. <laughs> and I just gave up. It's like, why even talk to someone like that at that moment? In First Timothy chapter 3, it talks about leaders and elders and and one of the things it says, the King James says it's apt to teach. A lot of more recent ones, uh, translations would say teachable. And I like the word coachable. I think it's a, it's a great uh, attribute to be someone who is teachable, to be someone who is coachable. We need to be open and teachable at all times. So parents, be on guard against favoritism. If you have a situation where that child really does need a lot of attention, make sure the other ones are getting it as well, or at least feel secure in where they're at. Teens, be on your guard, because there are going to be times when we're going to give responses that we just did not know everything about it. Don't feel bad, teens. All of us are in that boat. All of us are of the ones that we don't know everything about everything. So um, we just need to be guarded. Another possible thing to think about is watch your motives and don't manipulate. Oh, well, I did, um, thought I had that on there. That's my fault. Don't manipulate. If you manipulate, you might just get what you schemed for and then wish you did not. Uh, how many times have people, you know, tried to get something and just worked so hard and and manipulate all the circumstances, and it turns out that was not a good thing to have. That was not a good thing to experience. So let's go right there. Let's talk about trusting God. Trusting God, who is providential. He is there every minute of every day and daily cares for us. He is our guide. He is the one who protects us. As we go through the rest of the study, Joseph, in the next 13 years, is going to be filled with tests and trials. And it seems like every time he goes through something, there's another hoop for him to jump through. If Joseph would have been the kind of person who just thought about his circumstances, what was going on around him at the moment, he would have certainly been despaired of all hope. It would have been hopeless to him. But he was someone who trusted in God, and he was willing to follow him. Even when things look hopeless, a believer can have confidence that God knows what he's doing and that he is going to work out his perfect will through the life of the believer. You and I just need to know Christ as our Savior and we need to trust him, trust him with our lives, trust him with the circumstances that we're in, trust him to be God of our life, because he does know what we're going through. He goes through it with us, and he does have a perfect will for our lives that he is attempting to fit us into. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the guidance and the care that you give to us every day of our lives. You are there always, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, even as we come through a tough time in our land, uh, whether it's the virus or whether it's the violence, uh, there's so much that we need to learn from you, so much that we need to listen to you about. And we know that you care and that you are there, and we just pray that you would help us 
to trust you and to grow in our faith. Lord, if there's some watching or here today that are not followers or believers in Christ, may this be the day of salvation for them. May they come and acknowledge that Christ is the Savior who's done it all, paid it all for them, and that that price has been freely paid for and freely given to all who will believe. God, thank you so much for your love, your grace, and may Jesus Christ be exalted and praised. In his name we ask, amen.